Long before the idea of the internet video was popular, Michael had his ear to the train track, not literally, I hope, and he thought, you know what? I'm gonna use YouTube. I like making short films. What better place than YouTube? And at this point, YouTube, I think, just had a series of puppy videos, a um, couple kitten ones. And Mike's like, but I think I could do something with this. So week in, week out, on totallysketch.com, he made short films, and really funny short films. Not just random, not just wacky, but actually funny. Stuff with writing and acting. Stuff that shot really nicely. All the tools, of course, he learned right here at NIFA. And over time, his website grew. Totally sketch. I remember when it hit 100,000 subscribers and 200,000. Eventually, now it's over a million. And along the way, he changed the YouTube comedy form. Uh, he came up with this idea of choose your own adventure. Hmm. Hello? Mikey Gallagher. Speaking. I have a message for you. It will forever change your life. Sorry, I'm getting a call on the other line. Can you hold on just a second? Thank you, you're a doll. Uh, then, of course, there's this feature film, Smiley. The idea of, you know, going on the internet could kill you. We all know that. And he came up with a horror character a creation along the lines of Jason's hockey mask, Freddy's glove. It was the smiley emoticon on the face. 37 million hits that trailer got. We're talking Avengers level. But Mike's always been making movies. Mike's never waiting too long between projects. This dates back to, well, when I first got to meet Michael when he was 14. And he was a student here at New York Film Academy in the high school program. And I remember we had a chance to shoot at the Jurassic Park lot. And he was like, oh, yeah, so in this scene, uh, the dinosaur is going to chase you. And I was like, Mike, you realize it's an empty set. There's no dinosaurs here. Those were computer generated. I thought maybe Michael was off. Well, Michael was not off because Michael had a dinosaur in his pocket this big. And he said, this dinosaur is going to chase you and he's gonna attack you and do something horrible to you. And lo and behold, you watch the final film and it's, I'm not sure if it's entirely believable, but it's amazing. And that was the fun of working with Mike, even at age 14. Everything he did, he did full on. And year after year, he came back summer after summer, and I went from a teaching assistant to his teacher, and still somehow he would always be able to convince me, hey, you know, this uh, short, I, I need you in a bear suit. It's like, well, you know, it's 110 degrees out there, Mike, and. It's like, yeah, you know, I need you in a bear suit. And one heat stroke later, I was in a bear suit. And the next summer, I think I was in a bear suit again for him. Because when Mike asks you to do something, you have to say yes. And that's what he brings to every project he's done for all these years I've known him and for all his years as a filmmaker. And that's what he's bringing with him tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, internet sensation, Michael J. Gallagher. Well, how did you start? What's, uh, pretend we, I didn't say anything. I mean, were you starting before you did the high school? Were you already screwing around? Yeah, yeah. I would put my friends in shopping carts and like push them down a hill and <laughs> film that. Like Jackass was really big at the yeah. time, so we were like almost killing ourselves. Like all, seriously, like people almost died. <laughs> it's not funny. Yeah, this is actually a court case, <laughs> not, not an interview at all. Um, so for yourself then, when you were going from putting your it's friends like, in shopping although, carts. It's like those three kids and the J.J. Abrams oh, movie. Oh, Super 8. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that was totally Mike. That's my life story. Yeah, Super 8, <laughs> um, down to the alien invasion part, all realistic. Um, so for yourself, going from pushing your friends in shopping carts down in the hills of San Diego to then coming here was a little more organized chaos, we'll call it. Um, for yourself, what, what happened for you as a filmmaker then? Well, yeah, well, before I, I was basically untrained. I was just taking my dad's video camera and filming whatever I could. And then coming here, you know, introducing the idea of having SAG actors and having lights, <laughs> sound, <laughs> like, you know, the basics. Um, but, you know, from that, I got so high on just learning about how to actually make something that uh, it inspired me. So even when I wasn't at NIFA, I would go back and take that to my high school at the time, you know, my freshman year, my sophomore year, and I would just, with my friends, we would make better shorts. They were still terrible, but they were slightly better. <laughs> and 
my t slightly terrible, my very terrible, slightly better shorts would just like I would just keep churning them out. Like that was our activity. Oh, and then eventually we'd submit them to film festivals, and then I would get hired to make music videos for random, really bad San Diego bands. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was on my all way. of fifteen or sixteen. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, you, you did know, the trilogy, right? The flat trilogy. Yeah, I, was... I did a trilogy of short films. Uh, that no one has seen, or they won't ever see them. <laughs> no. Roll the clip. I, I have a copy uh, I'll, I'll sell for like dinner, <laughs> maybe <laughs> five, plus five bucks. Yeah, but there would be like, there, you know, every city kind of has a film festival, whether it's really small or big. And, uh, you know, we would submit, you know, every year. And for the, you know, I would submit starting at age 12 to 14, I would never get in. And I was, you know, I, I kind of, that was my goal is like, if I can get in, I'm at least on the path of doing this. And if I never get in, maybe I should go become an accountant. Um, and eventually we got in. And so that kind of inspired us to keep going and, and keep making. So you kind of need, you need some kind of benchmark to, mm -hmm. you know, keep your sanity. But by the way, about the fact that, um, you know, you kept making the movie and so on and so forth. So I, uh, it's not a secret like Scorsese's daughter has come also done three summers of the high school. And he said to me that he, what he loved about the NIFA high school program was he said they walk into a room and they hand them a camera. Yeah, you day know? one. Yeah, <laughs> and you make a movie and could be bad, but it doesn't matter, you make it. And now it's like you start you know, doing again and again. And yeah, again. I believe in the rule of 10,000 hours. Like you need time, you need mm -hmm. practice, you need to make terrible things until they're slightly less terrible, and then eventually they're good to okay. And, and that, that's what most movies are. Well, and I feel like, you, you know, and this might be for, for you guys who just started the high school program here, um, I feel like you never looked at the assignment as the limit. Meaning like, you know, now here's a music video. And mm. so you never thought about just having someone dancing around to uh, ABBA. At least, I don't think you That's did. That's a good idea. No, <laughs> every, every assignment I got, I took it as whatever they said not to do, I did it. Like, I would just double down on the, hey, the don'ts. You know, so we had one where it was like, don't use voiceover. Uh, don't explain. <laughs> if you have voiceover, for God's sakes, don't explain what is going on in the scene, <laughs> shot for shot. And I would just go the other way. And so I had... The whole movie was voiceover, and every shot was over-explained to the, you know, an annoying and, degree. And in French, right? In the sea, French. Sea captain. Yeah. And the best part was the subtitles didn't match the French at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was giving, like, directions to a subway, like, around so the you did it. So you did it, and what was the gist behind it? But I, I also felt like if everyone's going to do the same thing, if everyone's going to follow the same rules, then that's, you know, BS. Let's do the other thing. Let's, let's go against the grain, because if everyone's doing the same thing, it's going to be boring at some point. So you kind of have to find your own path. And I did it to a degree that maybe the movies weren't good. <laughs> maybe they're not watchable, or they're not entertaining to people. But, uh, <laughs> or legal. But I did it my way. <laughs> at least I did it my way. I have a question for you. So your sketches from that time uh you know they're funny but still there are many many people with the same kind of stuff on the internet so what is it about what you're doing that always gets the hits and always get the attention i think I try and make things not only for myself, like I always try and make something that I would enjoy, but I also think about the audience, you know. Um, I watch a lot of videos or short films or movies and sometimes it's like, who is this for? Like, who's, who's gonna enjoy watching this? And if, if, if you're making something and you're showing it to your mom or your friend and they're like falling asleep, cut it down, like make it better, like because there's a problem there. Um, and you know, I, I always get notes from people and I always feel like everyone has an idea, but it doesn't mean it's the right idea. But the, 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 when they tell you something is wrong, that means that your movie needs a little more work. Maybe it's not what they're saying, but you should just keep working on it. So I, just, I would always take notes from people and always just try and make it tighter and better. But as far as getting a bunch of hits, you, know, you, just, you wanna make things that uh, you know, people wanna share, people wanna actually watch. Now, you must be also a very smart marketer and a businessman because, you know, something goes on between just doing something good <clears throat> and actually 
getting the audience and so on and so forth. I think that I saw in one of your um, interviews or something where you said that one of the tools to get attention is if something is trending, mm -hmm. then you kind of do a parody of it or something, you know, on that subject matter. So when people are going to hit the original, they also see yours, they click on that. Mm -hmm. And then if they like it, they say, next time, let's see what that guy is doing. Exactly, yeah. Like um, nowadays, I don't know what the hot thing is right now, like, uh, like when Bruce Jenner became Caitlyn Jenner, uh, you could have made a video about that because everyone was talking about it. And if you had a funny angle on it, everyone would have maybe you know clicked your video looking for Caitlyn Jenner interviews or something, and maybe said, oh, you know what, that's really funny or that's really interesting. I'm going to watch more. So you can use you know what's already popular, what's already out there, as a way to kind of you know expose your content. Because when you're first starting out, no one knows you exist, you know, unless you have millions of dollars. But like no one knows like you're uploading things. So you need to figure out a way that they can find it. And whether that's working with somebody who already has followers and they can say, they can tweet or they can you know, do a post and say, hey, check out this guy's videos. Or if you make something that is already, you know, people are already talking about, already searching for, um, you know, YouTube is the second largest search engine next to Google. So if you make a video that has titles and tags that are what people are already searching for, then they might stumble upon your videos and and you could be sitting up here one day. Well, and I remembered, it's like you don't wait, you know, like something happens and you're not sitting there three weeks later saying, hey, wouldn't it be funny to make fun of Caitlyn Jenner, which right now she's in the zeitgeist, but come six months from now, we'll be thinking about someone else. Yeah, you kind of have to act fast because so many people, when they see a news story like that, when Caitlyn Jenner is existing, everybody's like, oh, I have an idea. And so many people have these ideas all over, but very few act on them. So if you can get there first, it's like if you can be first to the scene, you can, you know, grow your channel. And who finances all this? You call actors, you have cameras, you film. Oh, uh, well, when I started in high school, I would just sort of like slowly kind of collect film equipment, you know, like if I, you know, growing up when I was 12 or 13 for Christmas, I'd say, can I get lights? I get Kino flow lights. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a weird kid. Um, and so I would be unwrapping them, taking pictures with Kino flow lights. Um, but then, uh, so by the time I was making YouTube shorts, I already had some equipment and some people that I'd work with. And, you know, when I first started out, I would shoot the things myself. I would edit them. You know, I would have lobs that I could just put on people. And I was kind of a one-man band for, you know, the first six months or so. And then once the channel started making money from ad revenue, I could then hire people to, you know, do other work. And then you got connected eventually with Maker Studios. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that whole adventure. Yeah, so so Maker is, you know, it's a, a multi-channel network. It's essentially, it started out as this YouTube channel called The Station in 2009, where like people like Shane Dawson, Lisa Nova, uh, Dave Days, a bunch of people who were big on YouTube at the time, uh, wanted to come together and do like a sketch comedy channel, like a Saturday Night Live. And so they hired me to, you know, help direct and write and shoot and edit those kind of early videos. And while we were doing that, uh, the idea came across, you know, why don't we build this out and make more of a business of it? So everyone involved in the beginning, you know, we kind of changed our efforts from that towards, you know, building a bigger business. And that kind of quickly became a legitimate business with, you know, investors. And, and then that became, you know, uh, the, the whole structure of just a bunch of people working in, you know, kind of a, a shady apartment became like a professional company. And we were all kind of learning as we were going. And uh, before you know it, it became, you know, what it is At today. At which point investors came in and who brought them and all of that? Well, you know, I was more about the, I was more on the creative side. I was more, you know, making the actual content for it. Yes. But, you know, Dan Zapp and Lisa Nova, Ben Donovan, yes. like they were the, the, you know, three, like, you know, president, vice president, yes. and CEO. And they kind of ran, the operation and they kind of brought in people with those expertises. So. And and then Disney bought it for a fair amount of money. Yeah, wow, and crazy amount of money. Yeah. And how much of it is yours? All of it. All of it. <laughs> uh, no, I um, I have I got some money, which is nice, um, but you know not enough to buy like really nice clothes or anything. So um, <laughs> I'm not like driving a new car. Or, you know, I don't. Uh, you know, I, don't, I didn't take a helicopter here. It was a Yet. hovercraft, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's parked right in front. Um, it, I was wondering, too, you, uh, so Smiley, which I mentioned with the 30-some-odd mm. million hits for the trailer, which, mm. I mean, that's like Avengers level 
in terms of the number of people who saw your trailer. And it made a billion dollars. And one billion, <laughs> but one billion dollars in some country, maybe not this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, for you then, going from shorts, and, and you had done longer projects too, like the documentary, mm. of course, we, mm. about uh, Dan, but uh, for you, how, what was it like then to transition from doing these shorts, you know, sometimes as short as two minutes, to a feature horror film? Yeah, doing the feature was, it was in a way a lot easier than I thought because I, I think I had so much experience doing all these short films, you know, week to week, like Totally Sketch when it was running, like very consistently, it was like two times a week. So that was just, you know, it was like constantly being on set, putting things together. And a movie is essentially, you know, 50 to 100 scenes, you know, just back to back. So if I kind of looked at it rather than overwhelm myself and say, how am I going to make a whole movie? I just thought about it. Okay, this day I'm shooting four scenes. And that's kind of similar to, you know, a day of shooting a sketch where yeah. there might be a few scenes. So I just kind of took it day by day and, and planned it out. And uh, it, was, it was an easier transition than I thought. And actually I had a huge crew, which I never usually have. It's usually me and like two guys. So it was like a vacation. I'm just sitting in a chair like this and watch a monitor and eat grapes. That's <laughs> <laughs> what you do when you're a director. You ask for Was grapes. someone feeding them? Or you... Not yet. Uh, not yet. Watch the scene unfold. <laughs> yes. Say, action. Okay. <laughs> That's a good impression of me. <laughs> Thank you. You saw the behind the scenes footage, obviously, yeah. Uh, and, and then also for that movie, too, you had like known talent, um, including actors who, like uh, Caitlin, is Caitlin Gerard, in Gerard yeah. White, she's in American Crime now, but mm -hmm. Roger Bart, who won the Tony, you know? Yeah, he was in The Producers, and he was on Revenge. He was a bad guy yeah. in Revenge for a bunch of seasons. And yeah, I mean, we, you know, that was a fun experience because uh, I got to bring along a lot of my friends and actors that I had worked with on the shorts and the sketches, and I got to have them be in a movie. And it was, at first, everyone was like, why, you know, why don't you hire other actors, but I, I like working with the same people. Like I tried to bring along a lot of the same crew and it's just something something nice about growing up with a group. You know, I whether worked for it's... Ron Howard, he's been working with the same crew for 30 years. Yeah, because you get a shorthand with them. Totally. And you can make better, you know, it's, you become a well-oiled machine. He even can do post-production on one movie and kind of pre-production on another movie at the same time because by now people know so much what to do right. that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that uh, yeah. he can actually handle all of that at the same time. And so for yourself now, moving forward, you know, we're, we're talking briefly, like the short you did for Legendary kind of opened the door for you now to do more features. Yeah, I mean, that's... This short was done after Smiling? Yeah. Really? Sun, yeah, yeah. I did it last October. And the, yeah, the Unfinished Business, what you guys watched, um, the we shot that on the 27th of October, and it was out on YouTube on the 31st. Like, we turned it around, you know, three, four days. Um, and that was for this kind of contest with uh, Legendary, this film company. And they, they had Guillermo del Toro, this director, build these sets. Like, he designed them, and YouTube Space LA, like, put them together. Like, they put these amazing, you know, kind of haunted house sets together. And they allowed a bunch of people on YouTube to shoot them. So uh, we put our idea forth, and um, yeah, it helped get us in the door with Legendary, and now we're talking about making you know, feature-length movies with them. Not a bad day at the office, huh? Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, so here's the thing. I her jumping, right? Her coming out after the roof of roof, and now it's like been five minutes, so I don't even remember. But anyway, um, <laughs> and then... It's a while ago. I mean... It was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. And then you cut to the floor or something, and there's just the ball, right? Mm -hmm. That's when you lost me, though. I lost you? Yeah. OK. Because I was expecting something else. I was expecting a roof <laughs> or something. You're expecting a roof? OK. Did you guys get it? Yes. What was it? It was a it was a dog. They were haunted by a dog. So the thing that was scratching and attacking them yes. was a dog. So she was they were saying roof, roof, roof because she was possessed by a yes. dog. <laughs> this is why we have them here, so it explains it though. It's, okay. it's all right. So I can see two genres that you like. Mm -hmm. One of course is juvenile hor um <laughs> it, juvenile in a nice way. Humor. Thank you. Yeah. Listen, I saw all the jackasses movies. Nice. In That's 3D? That's what I like. <laughs> 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 
No, I like that kind of humor. So, okay, so it's that, and then I see that you like horror, mm -hmm. right? Is there any genres other than that that you like? I love all genres. Those are the two I can afford to make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's making people laugh is kind of cheap, and making people scared with you know corn syrup and you know strings that you erase later is pretty cheap. So, yeah. I try and I try and make things within my means. Sometimes uh, I want to do something bigger, but I, I kind of like to, uh, you know, take something and succeed at it on a smaller in a smaller way than to try and aim big and not have the money and have it look kind of, mm -hmm. you know, not good. That's very smart. Well, and because now they discover you like this legendary thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they got the whole thing with the dog. But, <laughs> but now that Hope they so. did, they offered you a job. Yeah. They hired you just to find out what happened with the bull. <laughs> They're like, what happened? All right, here's the contract, but tell us, the bull. Uh, well, and, and even in high school, I remember when you did um, this documentary about one of his classmates uh, who was trying to make a Supergirl TV show, which now, of course, he yeah. wasn't far off. He was six he was years ahead of his, He was ahead of his time. Ahead of his time, ahead of the curve, six or seven years uh, later. Now Supergirl is happening without mm. him, unfortunately. But I, I feel like you always get inspired by the things around you, and that includes mm. the people around you. You know, it, it's your shorts, their reactions to things happening in the world and pop culture. You know, even the horror movie was a reaction to the curse of the internet, if you will, and, you know, the assorted crazies on the internet who if I remember correctly, came out to, to sort of uh, try to rattle your cage a little bit when that movie came out. Yeah, I almost died, yeah. Well, you got threatened. You didn't, you didn't. <laughs> no. Really? No. You did so, get threatened. Yeah, true. when we did Smiley, the, uh, you know, 4chan is this website where uh, people go and, you know. Lonely, lonely post, people. Post interesting things that are very uh, inappropriate. But uh, they, we talked about them in the movie and we basically held up our middle finger at them and they didn't like that. And so they uh, came after us and they got all of our personal information and posted it online and, uh, you know, sent threatening messages to me and my cousins and extended family. And like, like somehow, like I think through Facebook, they like saw all, you know, like everything's all the, all the all our stuff's online. So yes. it's yeah. interesting that, you know, we made a movie about somebody kind of being, you know, threatened by this, you know, weird force online. And that's essentially what happened to us. So. It was kind of fun, but you know, we survived and <laughs> as, it's all as fun good. as fun as terroristic threats can be. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> it, was, it was the most fun terrorist. Yeah. But yeah. It, it also publicized your film. Yeah. I, mean, I would have liked to not have yeah, that I mean, app. there's better ways to do it, like advertising. Yeah. It was it was a bummer because we had a bunch of Q and A's planned with the you know cast that yeah, we were gonna go yeah. around to different theaters. Um, and then after that they were like, Oh, people wanna kill you, you can't uh, talk about your movie. <laughs> you can't like go out in public. So we had to like uh, go underground. It was weird. Yeah, I remember I saw you on Today Show or one of those. Mm. Like, I mean, it was kind of a big deal. But, but you know, you're, you know, even with a horror feature, you were still basing it on something, something out there. It wasn't just, mm -hmm. you know, something made out of thin air. Like you, and you know, I think this is something you've always been great at. Is like you see something there and you think, okay, what wouldn't it be great if? You know, it wouldn't be funny if. Yeah, and I think that's the benefit of doing stuff while you're young. Like, you guys are so awesome for being here and, and making things and wanting to be here, unless your families are, like, forcing you to get out of the house for the summer or something. <laughs> but, like, you know, being here and making stuff at such a young age, like, you have uh, you have way better ideas than, you know, the 40 and 50-year-olds who are actually making movies. So when if you keep at it, you know, I made Smiley when I was 22, you know, and it was my first movie. If you keep on this path, like you can be making movies at a pretty young age now and have ideas that are way more current, you know, and uh, and talk about things that uh, matter to you. The more you know. <laughs> no, I'm totally impressed about the quickness of your reaction and coming up with the short. Because it's one thing to have to see what's trending and what not. But, uh, and it's another thing to actually come up with a concept to make a short out of it. It's a very creative, you're on your feet creatively all the time, obviously, because, you know. Well, every situation is you know, a chance to write something. It's a chance to be creative. Like right now, I could imagine a sketch where, you know, we're talking, we're really engrossed in it, and then you cut to the audience and everyone's asleep. <laughs> you know, or dead, <laughs> and then or, we're just like or, really into it. You know, like that's way, that could be a series of bowls. They're all really, really interested, and in I'm asleep. Mm -hmm. That could be another one. That's not bad. 
That's going to be on Totally Sketch by Friday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, tonight. <laughs> tonight. That's right. Tonight is young. Yeah. Well, let's open up for the students because I'm sure they have a lot of questions. Hi. Hi. I'm Casey. Hi, Casey. I watch a lot of YouTube vlogs, and um, the some of the channels that I started watching were saying, oh, I just signed on with Maker Studios, and like Disney bought our company and whatnot. I just want to, I'm just so fascinated with that and how like, some of these vloggers got to go to the all-star conference in Disney World. And what, what is it about these vlog vloggers that you choose to be a part of your company? Well, right now, Maker is something where if anyone is making YouTube videos and they want to be a part of it, you can apply to be a part of Maker. Yeah, so it's all of you can join Disney family. <laughs> I'm not a good spokesman for that. Uh, <laughs> I need a little work. Once more with feeling. Yes. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're making content online and you have, you know, people are starting to subscribe to you or you get views, um, you know, you can apply to Maker and they can help you, you know, kind of grow your channel and, you know, give tips on your, uh, what you're titling your videos and they might help you introduce you to someone else who's making stuff and just try and, you know, it's all about kind of upping the quality of what you're doing. Thank you. And I enjoyed all of your movies. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for coming and sharing your experience with us. I just have a question. When I watch people talk, people like you who like just indulged in their creativity and things that they genuinely enjoyed and then became successful at it, I just wonder, like, while doing it, did you have a specific marketing or business target like when you first started uploading your videos to youtube were you thinking okay i want to reach this amount of people and how am i going to do that and 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 like what was your target were you just enjoying yourself and putting your creativity out there waiting to see what's going to happen or did you have a specific tar target in mind i think it's important to have a target in mind you know when i first started i gave myself six months of doing totally sketch because uh, i quit my job and I had saved up just a very small amount of money and I said, you know, I can live for about six months making very cheap <laughs> internet videos for about this long and then I run out of money and I die. So <laughs> I had to think, okay, how do I, you know, I, so that, that, that helped motivate me, just the thought of, of impending death. So, <laughs> so I started by, you know, saying, okay, the first video I make, that's the one I can be that annoying guy and go to all my f friends and family and anyone I know who has a Twitter following or anything and say, please help support and just talk about this for a second. Um, Cause you only really get like two of those shots in your life. And then everyone's super annoyed with you. Like if you're, you're posting every week about whatever you're doing, people kind of check out, but you got like, I, I saw it as at least I had one big favor to ask of everybody. So I knew that that first video, I was going to get some eyeballs from that. And then I also knew that I didn't have anybody else to watch it other than my extended family. So what I did was I would reach out to websites that were out there um, that would post videos, you know, like before BuzzFeed was a thing, but BuzzFeed and, um, you know, Reddit and all these different places. And I would go on forums and I would submit, they have contact areas and I would submit my videos and some of them would post it, especially if they were kind of good. I mean, they don't all get posted because some of them are just terrible, but you know, the good ones kind of, they get promoted and that really helps bring different audiences to it, different eyeballs. And so that first six months, I, you know, that was helpful. So then once I reached that and it was still doing well, then I said, okay, now I want to try and get a hundred thousand subscribers. And then I, that was my next goal. And then once I hit that goal, I just, you set a new one. You know, until you know you you die of old age, but you just but when you just you keep say, going. But when you say now you have a new target, uh, you know, from a hundred thousand to five hundred thousand, what are the steps to actually get it? Because I understand when you said you go to website and so on and so forth. You keep doing that same thing. You do or? it forever. <laughs> yeah, there's no stopping. Like you just keep expanding. You know, you keep. Uh, you know, you, you also, you can't do it alone. You need to find other people who are doing this. And, you know, uh, what I would do is I would offer my services as a director or filmmaker to other people online. So there's this guy, Alpha Cat, who, you know, looks very similar to Obama and did this great Obama impersonation. And so uh, when I first started, the, you know, election was still going on. And, you know, he had just been, Obama had just been elected. And so Alpha Cat was huge online. So I submit, I did not know him. I just wrote him a whole script. It was for this Jamie Foxx song, Blame It on the Alcohol. And I wrote a parody and sent it to him and sent him some of my work and said, hey, look, I will produce you a music video parody for free 
if I can work with you and if you'll, you know, if we can work together. And he accepted it. And so I made him a free music video and uh, it ended up getting featured on The View because he was so popular at the time and it got like four million views. And, you know, my name was promoted on that. And so people from, you know, watching that video came over and started watching what I was doing. And I would just do that for different people like Shane Dawson and Kasim G and Toby Turner and just all kinds of different, you know, YouTube folks. Um, and, you know, but it wasn't like, hey, promote me. Like, you can't just go and, like, ask for a favor. You have to, like, give something. And once you do that, then people are responsive. Because everyone loves a gift. Like, you know, who wouldn't want a, a free anything? Yeah. I love stuff, and I, I try and take it when it's offered to me. So. But, you know, we one of the assignments um, the adult students have here is they're supposed to do a music montage or just a full-out music video, and people were like, where am I going to find music? I'm like, you're in Los Angeles. <laughs> Open the paper. Yeah. We still have newspapers with paper in them, and there are bands everywhere. Like, go find them. And if you say, hey, I'm going to direct your video, they get excited about that. They like teaming up with people. And, and I think the thing you do that's that's so good, you you finish things. Mm. Like your your sketches, they're not half ideas. They're they actually have beginning, middles, and ends, you know. They're complete. And and I think people then trust that you're actually gonna make a product that will be finished, you know, on time, on budget, and producible, you know, something you could put on YouTube and it would get hits. Yeah, that and uh, you know, just being like a general okay person like just don't be a, a horrible human being because there's a lot of them and you don't want to work with them after a while you know it doesn't matter how good you are but if you're like a cool person you're helpful and you know you want other people to succeed and you work together like that that's infectious like you want to work with those people all the time you know so turn that frown upside down <laughs> remember remember that this summer when you're filming out in the back lot and it's like 110 degrees yeah when you're holding the boom for somebody just know you're hooking them up <laughs> yeah that, those are called Jesus points. <laughs> How did you uh, come up with the idea for the interns? Interns, we that was actually done through this company called Relativity, and they produce movies like Limitless. And uh, basically, we uh, we pitched this show to them. They wanted to do web series, and they had seen what we'd done on Totally Sketch, and they said, "Hey, come in and pitch us a show." So, we pitched this show of like these two guys who suck at their job, and you know. <laughs> always get into trouble and we said oh yeah and, and there's celebrities in it and they were like oh okay we'll do that show and then you know we, they gave us a very small amount of money and we made that show that looks like it was made for a very small amount of money so. <laughs> but it's funny they're very good those two uh, when you look for actors or actresses to be in your films what's the first thing you look for are you an actress? Yes. <laughs> You'd be great for my... No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> and just Put your headshot me. down, ma'am. Put your headshot down. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I guess I just look for people who are good at acting. <laughs> uh, you know, it's... Yeah, people who are good, uh, you know, it's it's that catch-22. You also want people who have experience, you know, ideally, uh, because sometimes when you're first starting out, you don't quite know how to act on camera. You don't know how to hit your mark, and so it's kind of nice to know that somebody's done some things. So I think a good, you know, uh, w the way most people start, I think, is doing you know student films, short films, and you know just you know you gotta hit the pavement. You just gotta audition. And um, what I look for in an actor is just to you know impress me, like do something with the material. Like when you're in a, a casting room and you're just waiting for you're just waiting for the right person to come in. So. You know, sometimes you have hundreds of people coming through, and it's just in our minds, it's just please be good. Like, please don't suck. That's all we want is just don't suck. And then, so when anytime someone comes in and, like, you know, they own it or they bring something to it or they make it funnier than it was or, you know, whatnot, it's that's that's what I want. I want somebody who's going to be cool and great on camera and have ideas and, you know, be exciting um, and good. Now, you could have been part of Maker, but instead, you have your own company channel, something, no? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm still a part of Maker. You are. Yeah, but also in addition to that, I have my own company. That you know, it's a production company, and you know, we make short form content, web series, feature films, and you know, we just started, and 
you know, we did a project for Focus Features. We did a music video for Insidious Chapter 3. And then uh, we, you know, we just sold a movie script that we're going to hopefully go into production on later this year. And, you know, all this came out of just doing stuff. You know, you just got to keep making things. Because I find that so many people just talk about what right. they want to do. Right. And I think what separates us is that, you, you know, we just make it. We just go do it. So. You know, Jonah Hill was here, and um, he started out, and he says the same thing all the time, just make stuff, just make stuff all the time. And he was a student, and there was like a little cafe or something, and he would go like every, you know, Friday or Saturday, and he'll just, you know, do a little scene that he wrote. Maybe it wasn't more than like five minutes, mm -hmm. but... You know, slowly people notice him, slowly he got better and better in doing it, you know, and before you know, it's like some agent came and suddenly signed him and, you know, and it was all because he just wasn't waiting for people to come to him. He just kept making stuff and making stuff. And yeah, no one, you know, no one will ever come to you to do anything. Like you have to do stuff. Yeah. And you have to just keep making things until people you know, realize that you exist as a human being. Uh, and then also a, a tip for all of you is just get really good at talking to 40-year-old uh, people uh, because you'll be having a lot of bottled waters sitting across from them, vaguely listening to your ideas. And so you just, you need to be able to talk to them and you know, hold the conversation and, you know, and not So learning, uh, learning how to really pitch. I think pitch and just, you know, be a cool person. Just be a, you know. I think it was your class a whole bunch of years ago where we we, we were talking about auditioning and, and how important it is even when, when you're auditioning an actor, they're also, how many of you guys here are filmmakers? Awesome. Yes. So guess what, filmmakers, when you're auditioning an actor, they're also auditioning you. And uh, in your class, we even practice using the phone because this was kind of like the beginning of text message and, yeah. and email and, and like we would actually like practice calling someone up and saying like your name, what your project is, when the audition is, which sounds really goofy, but even just what you're saying about conversation with someone, you know, for you filmmakers, like, it, yeah, you gotta be comfortable talking with people and communicating and also, you know, something I know Mike's really great at is communicating excitement. You know, if you love this project and you're excited about doing it, well, guess what? The director sets the barometer for the set. You, it's up to you. So if you go there and you're in a bad mood, no one else is gonna be in a great mood. Yeah, and especially if you have no money, like, you yeah. know, <laughs> happiness is free-ish, and you, you just have to like, you know, <laughs> you have to put on, even if it's like the worst day of your life, yeah. you're like, aren't we having fun? Isn't this great? We, it's raining and the camera broke and we got <laughs> nothing, but it's just fun. We're just out here, we're just having a good time, just shooting something that no one will like, but you know what, we're learning and it's, it's fun. So just have that attitude and everyone will be like, yeah, we are having fun. Yeah. That was more your subtext, I think, uh, what you, you put out front. That right, keep that internal, but yeah, I, I, right, and, that, and that's how you finish. I mean, that's how you get through, like, the way too many setups you're going to try to do every time you're on set, is, like, yeah, having that kind of energy and communicating that to other people, and then, then it is fun. Yeah, Plus, you it doesn't feel like work. how a really bad scene actually turns out somehow to be the best scene in a movie sometimes. Honestly, it's just full of... Movies are full of sometimes mistakes that turn out to be like really the best part. Happy accident. Yes, sir. Oh, hi. I was just wondering what your inspiration was for Unfinished Business. Inspiration. Well, that was interesting because we knew Guillermo del Toro was going to watch the videos. Like we knew that he was going to see some of the top ones. And he wanted like a, a horror short. He kind of made this one video saying, hey, if you're gonna make a video for this, I wanna see horror shorts, I wanna see something scary. And uh, oh, by the way, we have these sets. So I kind of had these locations, you know, for as a parameter. And sometimes that's helpful to have sort of a box of, you know, what you should create in. Because if sometimes a blank piece of paper is really scary, it's like, what am I gonna come up with? Like, you can just think of anything. And that's frightening. And so with the, uh, with Unfinished Business, you know, seeing that set, I knew I wanted to do a period piece because it kind of looked like, you know, a vintage feeling. And uh, and I wanted to do something that I could shoot out in one day because I only had one day on that set. 
So uh, we were just talking about ghost stories and what we'd seen and what we hadn't seen. And it's usually people haunted by something, by you know, spirit that hasn't been um, you know, released into the, the other, netherworld. Um, and so we thought of the idea of, you know, we hadn't seen a dog do that. So, and then what would that feel like? Oh, maybe it feels like a ghost is there, but then we reveal at the end it's a dog. And so we just, in very subtle ways, we show that it's a dog throughout. Um, so it's, it just kind of grew out of those questions. Like I just start with questions of like, what do I want to see? What do I want to achieve? And then from those questions, the answers start to emerge and then you start writing those ideas down. And I, I write with a writing partner, uh, this guy, Steve Green, and we would sit together and you know, we'll just talk it out. And it's really helpful to do that because sometimes you're just staring at the, the cursor blinking and you know you got nothing so but when you have somebody else there it's like you start talking about well what's going on in your life what you know i i do have to say about mike gallagher and the man who i've known now for 12 years it's right 12 years how old are you it's 26. yeah you're like a freshman what? Mm -hmm. what? you were a freshman with really great hair when i met you um you know what one of the great nights i had in los angeles and i've lived here 15 years was the premiere of smiley and I went with Benjamin Morgan, who used to run the high school program for years. And I, I, to say how proud I was could barely cover it. But it was such a it's proud like moment. And, and for me, I'm, I'm a parent now. I have two kids. And I hope my kids turn out nothing like you, of course. Um, <laughs> because I like, you know, you're so fun. I want my kids to be serious, you know. Um, now, you have you been. I want them to go to college. I want them to go, ah, college is OK. <laughs> You've done all right, though. Um, now, it's really. Um, to. You know, people say, oh, you, I knew you when you were this little. You, you were about the same height. Um, but you basically, as long as I knew you, you were a filmmaker. And that's the thing. Like, I was just out of film school myself. I was a teaching assistant. And you just always came to set ready to rock. You made the job so much fun. And then over the years, watching your stuff, you know, as, as a teacher and then as a friend, as a fan, it's been amazing. And the idea, we had him come here before and he screened Smiley over at the Warner Brothers uh, Theater. And we brought you back here with your shorts. And I know we'll keep bringing you back as long as you let us keep bringing you back. Um, and I know you're always going to be making more stuff. And it's been, yeah. for, for 12 years now, it's just been amazing to watch. And I keep looking forward to seeing what you're going to do next. And I know it's going to be amazing. Thanks, man. I feel, like, I feel like this is very, got very Barbara Walters here. But no, seriously, like when I was here during, uh, you know, when I, I was a teenager doing uh, NIFA. It was, they were like the best, it was the best summer of my life. You will start getting seeds of ideas that you'll expand on and you'll work on over the years and hopefully, you know, you'll stay at it because it's, it's and really also, fun. And also sometimes, not even at the high school here, you know, people are, they always want to know how to reach De Niro or whatever. And I'm saying to them, you know, the next De Niro is in the class with you. The next cinematographer, Walter Pfister, is in the class with you. You know what I mean? You have this community where, you know, you start working with your colleagues and you grow together, you know? If you can't get Al Pacino, get a funny-looking kid who kind of looks like Al Pacino. <laughs> no one will know the difference. It's non-union equivalent. It'll work cheaper. It'll work for gas money. Round of applause, Michael Gallagher.